Good morning. Welcome to West Hill United Church. My name is Reverend Evan Swan-Smith. I use he, she, they pronouns. Um, and it's so good to be here this morning. Um, this has been a really exciting week. Um, first of all, we had our solar eclipse party and had over 60 people uh, present. Um, it was very cloudy. <laughs> Um, and so some of you might remember that I had said a couple of weeks ago, the weather's not looking great, if you could just pray. And then the next week I was like, whoa, I don't know what happened, but like the weather's cleared up. So what we discovered during our solar eclipse party was that while we had some clouds in Font Hill, it was beautiful and sunny here. And if you were here at the church, you could see the eclipse perfectly. So uh, one of Chris's friends who was with us, who's not a member of this church, said the problem is you guys prayed in the wrong spot. Um, so apparently if you were at the church or around the church, it was beautiful. It was beautiful in Font Hill. Um, it was really cool to see the sun rise from the wrong side of my property. Um, and a huge thanks to everybody who came out. It was just such a great day and we're still eating leftovers. So, um, so hopefully we can do that again, not for an eclipse for another 300 years, but, um, for something fun. Um, also, uh, this is kind of a shout out to our viewers who watch on YouTube every week, um, because this week we met a milestone that I think is a pretty big milestone for a church, which is that our online worship has had over 10,000 views. Yeah. Um, and so, sort of clapping for our, our online church community, as well as our tech team who makes this possible. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's such a neat thing that, uh, that we're able to continue to offer. Um, and so a huge thank you if you watch us at home, uh, online during the week. Um, also, if you want to be involved in the church community uh, in deeper ways, there's ways that that can happen. Feel free to email me, email the office, um, and we're happy to make those connections. Why don't we begin this morning by acknowledging this land that we're on. So we acknowledge that West Hill United Church is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people, and that this land is governed by the dish with one spoon wampum. We recognize that this is sacred land. We remember that without Mother Earth, we cease to exist. We acknowledge that we are treaty people. We give thanks for the stewards of this creation. We commit ourselves to fighting injustice and we will take solid action towards right relations. I pray that the Creator blesses us. Peace be with you. Come and see love God has given to us. Come and see what it means to be children of God. Come with the, this hope that Christ present, oh, presents Israel. Miraculous God, come to us now, even as your Son came to those first disciples on the shore of Galilee. Speak your peace to our hearts. Touch us with your Holy Spirit. Reveal your word that we may hear your message this day and live as your disciples in the days and years to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. You guys, what do you guys know about fingerprints? <coughs> They're on people's fingers. That is a great answer. True. I would invite everybody to look at your hands. So pick one of your hands and start by looking at your fingertips and look and see if you can see your fingerprints. Can you see them? Yeah. And then if you follow down your hand, you can look at your palm. And there's all kinds of lines on your palm. And then you can follow right back up to your thumb, and your thumb has thumbprints too. And did you know, I'm not going to get you guys to do this, that if you look at your feet, your toes also have, I guess they would be toe prints, the same as your fingers. And everybody's fingerprints are unique. Nobody in the world has the same fingerprints as you. How cool is that? It's kind of kind of cool. Although part of me is glad that my family doesn't check our fingerprints or they would know who had ate all the cookies from the solar eclipse party. It's been a bit of a mystery in our house lately. It wasn't me. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I wasn't home when it happened. But um, that's how, so fingerprints can be used for uh, lots of things. Uh, they can be used to tell who's touched things. Um, sometimes police can like take fingerprints from crime scenes uh, and match them into their database and that's actually often how they catch people is because everyone's fingerprints are so unique. Um, and so when I think about the fact that our fingerprints are unique, I think about the fact that God is just this really cool artist who has made our bodies exactly how they are. And so each of us has our own fingerprints. And when I think about that, I think about the fact that that must mean that God has made each of us really special because God has taken the time to make sure that our fingerprints are unique, that our bodies are unique. Um, and to me, it says that God doesn't expect us all to be exactly the same because everything's different. So it means that God wants us to be able to live our lives as we are and to be proud of who we are because each of us are unique and we have these unique things. Yeah, you can see there's fingerprints up on the conversation time slide um, that look super different and those are actually different types of fingerprints. I think that the first one is from a thumb because it's really, see how the lines are all really tight together? But see when you look at them big, how different all the patterns are? So I like looking at my fingerprints because it helps to remind me of how unique God has made this world and that everything uh, has diversity in it and looks really different. Why don't we join together in our creed, uh, which talks about some of the ways that we are the same with the things that we believe. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life death, in 
and life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Which one of you is going to take the Christ candle? It's right here. Perfect. Every week as we worship together, we have the opportunity to admit to ourselves, to each other, and to God that we don't always live as we are called. In this time of confession, this time of opening our hearts, let us remember that God is merciful and just, eager to offer grace and love. Let us pray. Holy and righteous one, we are stunned by the miracles of new life and forgiveness you offer. When our awe turns to disbelief, renew us with your joy. When our fear turns into rejection, lead us into your presence. When our stumbling leads to sin, forgive us by your grace and direct our steps in the paths of righteousness. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Beloved, we are God's children now, and because we have this hope, we are forgiven. As beloved children, we are made one with Christ and brought into the good and righteousness of God. Amen. Our first reading is from 1 John 3, 1 to 7. See what love the Creator has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know God. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when God is revealed, we will be like them, for we will see God as they are. And all who have this hope in God purify themselves, just as God is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that God has revealed to take away sin, and them there is no sin. No one who abides in God sins. No one who sins has either, been, either seen God or known them. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as God is righteous. The word of Holy Scripture.
just had a moment where that was so beautiful and I was so into it that it stopped and I was like, oh, I wonder what the next song is gonna be and then remembered it's my turn now. Our second reading this morning is from John, uh, chapter 21, verses 20 to 25. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I return, what is it to you? follow me. So the rumor spread among the brothers and sisters that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if it is my will that he remain until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written, the Word of God. Surprise, we're talking about Peter. <laughs> um, I was trying to decide what to preach on this week, and I, because of Wandering Heart, we had sort of wandered off the lectionary as well. And so the story that was meant for this week, it seemed a little bit weird to talk about because it was slightly different than what we talked about last week. And so I went back to John, where we had our story last week of Jesus meeting with some of the disciples by the seashore. And I realized that there's this passage that's the very ending of John, and it's the continuation of that story, um, and that often we don't get to hear about it in church. So I thought that this week we would just go with it and sort of finish the story. So you might remember that last week Jesus met with some of the disciples and ate breakfast with them on the shore of the water. And, Jesus went, and after Jesus was done asking Peter three times if Peter loved him, do you remember what Jesus told Peter? He told him he was likely going to be martyred for his beliefs and have to die a painful death. And then he says, follow me. And that's where last week's story ended. And so that's exactly what today's gospel reading tells us that he did. Peter immediately goes with Jesus despite the warnings of this possible death. But if there's one thing that I think we've learned so far about Peter, it's that he's never perfect. And here we have another example of this. So just as it seems that Peter has made a great and faithful decision to follow Jesus, he turns around and sees the disciple that Jesus loved following them. So I think we need to start with who is this disciple that Jesus loved? There's a lot of debate about it, but there's also a lot of evidence pointing toward it being John. According to Pastor John Piper, we know from the other Gospels that Peter, James, and John were the closest associates of Jesus. For example, those three, Peter, James, and John, Went up, the mount of, went up on the mount when Jesus was transfigured. And so it appears from the way that the gospel presents this unnamed disciple that he had a close relationship with Peter. For example, at the Last Supper in John, it reads one of the disciples who Jesus loved was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus, of whom he was speaking when Jesus mentioned that there was going to be someone who would betray him. The unnamed disciple is close at Jesus' side, and Peter has this exchange of communication with him. Then on the morning of the resurrection, Mary Magdalene runs to report what she has seen, and it says, so she ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. So there they are, apparently hanging out together, this unnamed disciple and Peter. And then the author of this gospel tells us that the sons of Zebedee, who would have been James and John, are fishing with Peter and four other disciples. And when Jesus called out from the shore to them, it says in verse 7, the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. So you have this repeated close relationship between the disciple who Jesus loved and Peter, and we know that Peter, James, and John had this very intimate friendship with each other. And we know that John, one of the sons of Zebedee, was on the boat fishing when Jesus approached them. 
And at the time that this gospel was written, we also know from the book of Acts that James had been killed, so he's out of the question. So then at the end of today's gospel, the writer identifies himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. So we kind of need to assume that the disciple who is following Peter and Jesus is John. And so why is Peter, who had this intimate and close relationship with John, asking Jesus about him? I think often this is read as a moment of jealousy, some sort of rivalry between Peter and John. But as far as we know, their relationship had been good. I mean, they were, after all, just fishing together. And Jesus has just restored Peter to his role as leader of the flock, so why would Peter be feeling jealousy? It's far more likely that Peter, who has just been told by Jesus about his death, wants to know also what's going to happen to John. Is he also going to suffer a terrible fate because of his decision to follow Jesus, or will he fare better than Peter? To me, it makes more sense that Peter is asking this question out of curiosity and concern for his friend, someone that he also loves and cares about. But Jesus is clear that it's none of his business. Instead of focusing on others, he needs to focus on his own relationship with Jesus. He needs to use his energy to create and carry out a plan of what it means to live his life as a follower of the risen Christ. What is meant for Peter is for Peter, and what is meant for John will be John's. This teaching reminds me of a teaching I received from an Anishinaabe knowledge keeper, and he explained that each of us was placed here by our Creator and given a path to walk. And sometimes we stray from that path, but eventually we'll make our way back. However, it's not up to us to interfere with each other's paths. In fact, it's people interfering with other people's walks with the Creator that cause most of the problems that we face in this world. In my own Christian spirituality, I share a similar belief that each of us are called by God to live our lives in a good way. And when we interfere with someone else's ability to do it, that is the very definition of sin. But if we look at our world, we can see examples everywhere of interfering in other people's paths. Whether it's reproductive rights, access to gender-affirming care, the fight over who has the right to what land, we can see this happening all around us and causing conflict. But Jesus knew that conflict was the very thing that was going to cause divisions and tear his community apart. That's why so many of his teachings had to do with community solidarity and restoration. His teachings were continued by his followers, and we find this in the book of 1 John. And again, the author of 1 John, which is different than the Gospel of John, has been long debated, and it's no longer thought that it's the same person who wrote John. However, it's commonly held that they were part of the same community together. 1 John is an epistle or a letter that was written to the early church warning them against false prophets and teachings that were causing divisions. It's an important document because it outlines how we are to be the church. And so I'm going to delve into it a little bit over the next few weeks, but today we're focusing on the beginning of chapter 3, which is about identity. The writer of the letter begins this section saying that we are children of God. That is our identity, and it has been gifted to us out of the love that God has for us. But it also makes note that the world may not be able to recognize us as God's children, because the world also wasn't or isn't always able to recognize when God is in its midst. And it talks about sin. It talks about sin a lot. And it reminds us that if we have seen and known God, we do not live our lives in sin. And this isn't necessarily talking about small individual acts, the mistakes that we all make. The writer is clear in the beginning of their letter that it's impossible to live and never to commit a sin. But it's talking about the way that we live our lives as a whole. Because if we understand ourselves to be children of God, and if we understand God to be the center of love in the universe, then we are called to live our lives exuding God's love into the world. And in order to live out that love, we can't interfere with people's lives in ways that are unjust, oppressive, or that in one way or another risk convincing them that they are not children of God. This is reflective of what Jesus tries to impart on Peter when Peter questions John's fate. Peter's on his own journey with Jesus, just as John is on his own journey. And these journeys look different. 
Maybe John will seem pious and like the perfect disciple, meanwhile making Peter look like he continues to make mistakes and misunderstands what's happening. Maybe Peter will die at the hands of the state just as Jesus did, meanwhile John might, might meet another fate, better or worse. But what Jesus is clear about is that it's not up to Peter to worry about it. What Peter is to worry about is whether he will answer the calls that Jesus placed on him to feed and shepherd his lambs and sheep and to follow him. The only thing that Peter needs to concern himself with is knowing that he is a child of God and that he is called to serve and care for those around him. May we also live out our lives in ways that we will be identifiable as children of God to those that know them, and that to those who don't, we will be a reflection of God's love and justice in this world. Amen. So our minute of mission this morning is about supporting a right-based approach to growing food, which is something we are all probably interested in. ADES works closely with the communities to grow food in rural regions of El Salvador. The Association of Economic and Social Development, Santa Maria, ADES, a mission and service partner, is located in an area of Central America that is very vulnerable to climate change. This hot, dry reg region regularly experiences drought. Mining projects there have also negatively infected the environment and the people of the region. ADES and other community organizations decide to act to protect the community's rights to a healthy environment. An example of how ADES has responded is a three-year agroecology project co-founded by the Manitoba Council of International Cooperation and the United Church of Canada Foundation, along with Mission and Service. Agroecology benefits the land, water, and because it recycles nutrients back into the soil. It also reduces production costs, lessening the financial burden on rural farmers. In this project, 
ADES, works closely with other communities to grow food in rural regions of El Salvador, promoting sustainable agriculture that projects diversity, maintains the integrity of the land, and upholds rural culture. At the center of the project is the Dora Alicia Sorto farm, uh, School Farm, where rural families, mainly led by women, learn about agroecology. The school provides training, technical expertise, and seeds indigenous to the region. It focuses on the preventing the surrounding environment and are preserving rather the surrounding environment and upholding gender and human rights as part of the approach to food security. So your gifts to the Mission and Service Fund help support ADES projects. If you wish to include this in your monthly or weekly givings, uh, you have to designate any monies to mission and service funds. And if you need any assistance on this, I'm sure Glenn, our church treasurer, can assist you on doing that, as he has done me, with me in the past. Thank you very much. Thanks, Norm. It's exciting to hear about growing projects um, around the world. I think as, uh, I don't know about, well, Norm, I'm sure that you have seedlings uh, on the go, but, uh, I was just looking across the street this morning at all the flowers coming up over at Mission Baptist um, flower beds, and there's always come up a little bit earlier because they, I think, get more sun. Um, and ours are starting to spring up here, and I know my house is covered in seedlings. Um, and so I think it's such an important thing as a church, um, and as a church that uh, cares a lot about creation, to think about the ways that, uh, that we can fight for food justice and also support people. Um, to be able to have food security in the most just ways possible. Um, when you give to West Dale United Church, uh, you have the option to give to the Mission Service Fund of the United Church of Canada, um, or to, uh, I'm sorry, to give your offerings, which help support uh, this church as well as our community outreach projects. There's several ways that you can give here at West Dale. There's plates at the back of the sanctuary as you leave. Um, you can sign up for PAR, which is a way of giving a monthly donation straight out of your bank account or credit card. Um, and you can always e-transfer through the main church email or send a check by mail. Let's join together in prayer. God, we're so grateful to have been called your children and to have been called to care for your sheep in the same way that Peter was. And so, God, we just ask that you would take our physical donations, our financial donations, and all of our prayers and the hours that we volunteer in the community and all of the other ways that we give back and use these to show the world that you are present in it and that your love abounds. And God, we especially pray for those right now who are facing food insecurity. And we just ask that these gifts would help them to be able to grow food and to have access to food in just and loving ways. With gratefulness for all of creation and for your calling on our lives, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God calls us to be a praying people, so let us join our hearts and voices together to offer our prayers to God. After each prayer or group, the response is, God, in your mercy, to which all respond, hear our prayer. And we have changed the sung response this week.
O oh God, your son remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors. As his disciples in this age, we offer our prayers on behalf of the universe in which we are privileged to live and our neighbors with whom we share it. Let us pray for the sick and for those who suffer, for all in nursing homes, hospices, and for those who are housebound. We remember all who are sick or in need of healing, among them Bill and Deb's friend Tom, who is undergoing cancer treatments, and Renna, who is in the hospital after a stroke. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We name before you all those with particular needs who have asked for our prayers, especially Stephanie. May they know your presence with them and that you are their strength, their healing, and their salvation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all members, congregations, and staff of the United Church of Canada. We hold in your presence all members of this church family. Ensure that they know that they are valued, loved, and cared for by this congregation. In our own region, we pray this week for Linville United Church. May they continue to bear faithful witness to your love in the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, open our hearts to your power moving around us and between us and within us until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy, in communities transformed by justice and compassion and the healing of all that is broken. We offer all these prayers to you, God, as we pray together in the way that Jesus taught us, saying, Loving God, in whom is heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the dominion, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Guess what day it is today? It's finally Music Feeds the Soul. I feel like this has come very quickly <laughs> um, from when we first announced it. Um, it's today at three o'clock. Tickets are $25. They are still available at the door. Um, it's gonna be an amazing concert and I'm just, I'm so excited about it. Um, we also have a silent auction as part of it. For those of you who are here in person today, you have probably seen the silent auction at the back um, because uh, Deb has worked very, very hard to put this together um, and want to get everything set up early. Um, you do have the option to bid on the silent auction items at the end of church if you would like. Um, but what I will say is if you don't come to the concert as well, you're probably not gonna win because you're gonna have to keep bidding higher. Um, so feel free to take a look at the items. If you feel called to bid and aren't able to make it to the concert, um, try your luck, who knows? Um, but also I would uh, strongly encourage folks to come out to the, uh, to the concert, it's gonna be really great. Um, and uh, we heard from Rosemary last week, so there is still a call out for donations for baked goods uh, for McMaster Chaplaincy. <coughs> Uh, they offer a, a space for um, students to come and to gather during exams. 
Um, they can study, they can talk to somebody. It's a really stressful time. I know any of you who were students or have students in your life or are a student know how stressful this season can be. Um, so Rosemary uh, is happy to pick up the donations, take it over to McMaster. Rosemary, can you wave for a second so people know who you are that are here? Um, and of course, donations of fruit and juice are also available. Um, as we're you know, talking a little bit about food insecurity and growing, um, we know that healthy food is getting harder and harder to access. Um, so those would also be most welcome. Um, a reminder, a few people have already RSVP'd that we are switching up our youth groups for the beginning of May. So on Monday, May 6, um, all of the junior and senior Y, so this is anyone from grades four up to like university in your 20s, are welcome to come and join us for laser tag. Um, we will be paying the costs. We just need you to register uh, through the church office so that we know how many people we are expecting. Um, and then the following week, uh, we're having a button making party to make buttons for Pride, to hand out at our Pride service and also um, at Pride events. Um, anyone is welcome to come to this. So it's at our normal youth group time, which is 6 to 7.30. Um, but if you want to come and make some buttons, uh, it would be lots of fun. And we'll have, we'll have pizza and, uh, and have some fun together. So that's on uh, May 13th and from 6 to 7.30. And we'll end today with one of my favorite hymns. Um, and thank you, Shirley, for always putting up with my hymn selections. <laughs> um, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. My friends, may you go into this world knowing that you have been called children of God, and may you be the source of love and goodness and justice that the world needs. And may you go surrounded by the love of God and by the grace of Jesus Christ and by the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit. And may your love surround those and everyone that you meet. Amen.